Okay, so let's start from the first student. Um, do we have the slides? Okay, so Martin. All right. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Martin Ostrowski, and today we will talk about part of the research I've done during the second year of my PhD. So I think we can all agree on the fact that DDoS attacks are a major threat to the internet infrastructure. And new vulnerabilities such as the MemcacheD attack um, break new attack volume records every year. So uh, there are several uh, mitigation techniques and one of them is the remotely triggered black holding. Black, hole, black holding is a BGP based mitigation technique that blocks traffic to a destination prefix. Um, the great thing about black holding is that it drops traffic before it reaches the victim and also reduces the load for intermediate networks. However, there is an obvious drawback. Black holding filters all traffic to the victim. This means that there is no difference between malicious DDoS traffic and productive traffic. Um, we call the dropping of productive traffic collateral damage. So this has two consequences. First, the DDoS attack becomes successful because the users cannot reach the server anymore. Second, the victim does not receive any status information about the uh, attack because the black hole is active. And the only possibility to know if the, active is, if the attack is still going on is to deactivate the black hole and activate it again. So to prevent collateral damage, uh, we need a fine-grained black hole so solution. And one possible candidate for this is a BGP extension called BGP Fallback. BGP Fallback allows to drop uh, traffic uh, also by transport layer property, such as protocol, port, packet size, and so on. To give you an example, in this case, um, the victim of the DDoS attack would drop all the malicious UDP traffic based on the memcache port. However, the HTTP request would still reach the server. So this leads us to the research question. How large is the collateral damage introduced by black holding? Um, are we actually able to differentiate between the DDoS traffic and the productive traffic? And um, the third question is, uh, what are effective deployment points for BGP flow spec? So detecting DDoS attack would be the, uh, detecting DDoS traces would be the first step. However, detecting DDoS traffic in the network is quite challenging. The first problem is the limited visibility. Um, we have to deal with packet sampling and also traces only for specific time ranges. The second thing is that sudden traffic changes are not always malicious. So, uh, for example, flash droughts that increase the uh, traffic volume are legitimate. So, we tackle these challenges at two vantage points. So, at the ISP, we use a data set that is already labeled um, by the Mavi anomaly detectors. And at, at the IXP, our second vantage point, we actually have to do a uh, labeling by ourselves. And uh, we identify the, black, uh, the DDoS traffic by public uh, black holding event. So let's first take a look at the ISP. At the ISP, for every DDoS event, we assume uh, we check every DDoS event and assume a black holing um, mitigation technique. So to give you an example from March 2015, we see here a TCP SYN flood. Um, black holing would drop over 800,000 packets. However, if we would use every property of the attack we know, uh, we would drop around 40% of packets less. So this is the amount of packets that would be saved by flow spec or that we call collateral damage. Um, we did this for every DDoS event, for every attack type over several years. And um, to give you uh, the box plotted data for 2016, you see here that we actually um, have a collateral damage of around 20 to 30%. We also asked ourselves how complex do the flow spec rules have to be? And we did this also again, um, separated by the DDoS type and we counted the components that we need to separate the DDoS attack from the productive traffic. And what we find out is that we do not need many components. We do 
not need complex uh, rules to save productive stresses. Usually, you only need three to four components. So let's compare this to the IXP. Um, just to recap, at the IXP, we use public black calling announcements to infer when a member IP at the IXP um, was under DDoS attack. Um, we check its traffic properties before the black calling and during the black calling. Um, we did this for half a year. What we found out is that actually uh, around 70 member IPs uh, were protected by black calling. We saw only 18, uh, for only 18 IP addresses DDoS traffic and only four IP addresses actually had productive traffic before the DDoS. To give you an example how this looks like, so what we see here is the traffic to a specific IP address present at the IXP topology. Over time, and on the y-axis, you see the number of sample packets. Um, the gray background indicates the time of black holding. Mm, we learned learn two things here. First, um, indicated by the green circle, um, we sampling um, killed small mice flows, which means that the legitimate flows were almost not visible. The second thing we've seen here is that we had uh, only UDP attacks, at least for our cases. Um, the good thing about the amplified UDP traffic is that uh, the traffic from amplifiers to the victim is actually not spoofed. So what we did is we checked where are the amplifiers located in, in which network. And what we found out is that uh, around 35% of the amplified DDoS traffic actually or originates from a member AS. And another 23% of the added traffic is only one AS of, uh, away. So we argue that this locality of the attack traffic actually allows fast mitigation. Um, to conclude my talk, um, we saw on average around 30% collateral damage introduced by black holding. Um, we saw precise filtering of DDoS traffic with flow spec components, and that is actually possible. Um, flow spec does not need many components to save productive traffic, only around three to four. And uh, we saw fast mitigation of amplified DDoS traffic at the IXP, and uh, that is actually possible because of the locality of the amplifiers. So, the last slide uh, are the next steps. Um, in, in, in the future work, we want to have a more detailed model of legitimate and malicious traffic. And um, one thing FlowSpec also allows is not only the dropping of packets, but also rate limiting traffic. And we want to um, uh, investigate on the benef benefits of rate limiting. Um, two more things. Um, there are also um, scrubbing centers that um, filter DDoS traffic and we want to check if we actually can create more fine grid legitimate hijacks to those scrubbing centers. And at the end, we also want to check if uh, what would be a um, acceptable trust and propagation model for BGP flow spec to be deployed. Thank you very much for listening this early morning to me. <laughs> So, um, um, so the BGP flow spec allows the mit mitigation by transfer player uh, properties, which means that if we see attacks that, that actually happen at layer seven, we would not be able to mitigate them with flow spec. So um, if in future the development would be more around layer seven attacks, 
then it wouldn't be very difficult to, to handle them in the first place. However, if we uh, keep at the level of amplification, where we just discover new amplification services that are um, uh, filter, that we are able to filter only open in the, in the transport layer, BGP process would still be able to do that. Yeah. So uh, the question was how many rules uh, can we have, right? And how, I get, okay, so uh, to the first question, actually major right, uh, routing suits already uh, implemented the GP process, it's generalized since 2009, and uh, Cisco, Juniper, and so on support it. Uh, the open routing suits just got up. I think BERT, for example, is supported from version 2.0, I think. And um, on the second question, actually, um, about uh, how many resources they use. Um, there was a NANOS talk, at, uh, which I think was two months ago, which uh, has uh, specific numbers in them. I just don't have them in mind right now. Uh, idea on roughly the number of rules that you could support on any kind of a router interface and what additional resources it would actually consume on the router and also, do you know how far the IPv6 support for flow spec is? Um, <laughs> so what we did in some of the tests was to create uh, random BGP flow specs and enter them in, in a table just to see how it behaves. And what we saw is uh, a linear growth. So we basically checked uh, one or two of, of the implementations of the routing suits. But um, uh, I don't have a precise number to to, to give you now uh, as a memory um, reflex uh, utilization. Is there any additional question? Or? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. So the next speaker is uh, Kentan de Conin. Uh, so hello everyone. So it's about a presentation about multipath TCP and network handovers. So what multipath TCP? It's a, a network layer uh, uh, a transport layer protocol that allows to extend TCP in such a way that you can use uh, multiple uh, networks at the same time. Let's say that we have Wi-Fi in the cellular. And so there are two main use cases for multipath TCP today. This bandwidth aggregation and the network resiliency under uh, user mobility. For instance, when you have uh, mobile devices, and we are interested in that case in particular. And about the deployment of multipass CP, uh, iOS is the most deployed uh, implementation of uh, multipass CP. Now any application in iOS 11 can use multipass CP, and so uh, we will uh, study this case. So let's take our uh, situation of interest. So today uh, there are more and more voice activated applications like Siri, like Google Now, and so on. And also users are still asking for more uh, uh, network content like streaming uh, uh, video, audio, and so on. And so uh, they also move, the also users. So let's say at the beginning you are on Wi-Fi uh, and listening to music and uh, doing some serious stuff. And you are both connected to Wi-Fi and, and uh, cellular. And the question is what will happen uh, when you will leave the Wi-Fi reachability? So how does multipass TCP Will, uh, will cope with that user mobility. So we, and with that case, actually multipass TCP is interesting uh, compared to TCP because with TCP, if you lose the Wi-Fi, the, uh, the Wi-Fi, uh, the connection will be broken, the application will be notified. Here, everything is uh, completely uh, hidden to the application. So the application is not aware that there were something not happened. So about iOS multipass TCP, uh, there are three um, possible modes today that where multipass TCP can be run. The first one is the aggregate, which is not really public, it's only for developers, it, so it's just uh, aggregating the bandwidth, but mobile devices who don't want to use all the cellular uh, for your video, Wi-Fi is available. Then you, you, there is also an endover uh, mode, which uh, when you, your, the Wi-Fi is completely lawless, uh, you go on the cellular. And then uh, the interactive mode, which is actually the scheduling that was used before uh, with the Siri application, and which is now uh, available for all applications, it tries to keep low latency. And the question is how well does this low latency uh, be, uh, behavior works with uh, our uh, studies. 
So uh, to perform a measurement, we uh, made an application called Multipass Tester, so it is available on the iOS store. We had more than 100 users, and it performs a, li uh, a lot of uh, different kinds of uh, tests. And one of the tests we perform is the mobile one, where we have uh, 20 users and uh, a little less than 200 uh, measurements. And uh, we perform a multipass CP uh, run with uh, multipass uh, quick that we presented at uh, Connect before uh, to see how it behaves, etc. Et and so the traffic of interest, uh, the actual traffic of interest is this one. So we have two connections, one for uh, the flow uh, traffic and another one with a load load traffic. And we are doing a kind of request response traffic where we collect the, uh, the delay between sending uh, a data and collecting the applicative acknowledgement. And so the test uh, runs until we are completely lost uh, the Wi-Fi and we collect a lot of metadata like TCP info and so on. So first question is about what is a uh, an Andover, what we, we, we call an Andover. So this is like a, a possible uh, way of uh, switching from Wi-Fi to cellular with multipass CP. So after some time, the Wi-Fi uh, is doing uh, 2F uh, retransmission. Then for some reason, the phone will start using the cellular. But Wi-Fi cannot be lost, completely lost. It can be uh, like uh, uh, switching and so on. And so uh, there can be a, a, a gray area where you are using both Wi-Fi and cellular. And so this is what we call actually the Andover, and we are interested in the duration in multipass CP of that uh, Andover. And so the, here is uh, the result we observe. The first thing is that about the abrupt Andover, so just uh, Wi-Fi and then cellular, and I start using cellular, and never use Wi-Fi again. It's quite rare, it's only 10% of our measurements. Actually, with multipass CP, the Andover can last more than, in the typical case, it lasts more than 10 seconds to completely switch from uh, Wi-Fi to cellular. So the network on the other, actually, it's not an abrupt process. And this is interesting because it seems that uh, multipass protocols are, uh, can do interesting stuff in, uh, in that area. So then uh, with multipass CP, why are we using uh, the cellular uh, interface? Actually, in, uh, in, the, in the interactive mode, we, are, we have four conditions, which are explicit here about uh, the round trip time, if it's a go over threshold. The RTO, if it's a go over so a threshold, or if you are sending new data while uh, you are experiencing the transmission of Wi-Fi or the Wi-Fi assist uh, application of uh, Apple that does uh, uh, obscure thing. And so when we look at uh, our measurement, we notice that actually it's uh, mostly because you try to send new data when we have a transmission uh, that uh, causes uh, the cellular usage. But this is mostly because the our traffic uh, does this pattern. And then now, what is the, per the latency that is perceived by the application when you have this handover, actually? And so we compute the, the delay that we observe with our traffic, uh, the maximum delay that we show, and we observe that in the Bedian case, actually, we have like, uh, yeah, three seconds of uh, possible latency. So it means that uh, if you are doing Siri, during three seconds, your, your phone will do like no, nothing. So it's not very interactive. And you have slightly better performance over in the upload uh, case rather than the load because uh, the sender selects the path on which you will send data and the phone has a little better view of the network than the server. Uh, and also we also notice that we have a very huge latency for a few cases and actually those are related to uh, special configuration, network configuration where you have an IPv6 uh, Wi-Fi and an IPv4 only cellular because the implementation of multipass CP is not complete in, uh, in iOS, uh, then you have uh, this uh, kind of uh, pathological cases. And then we also decide to compare uh, the performance of uh, multipass CP with multipass quick. And so we observe that actually we can do better than uh, what we, uh, we have multipass CP. This is related to two reasons. The first one is that because uh, of quick, we can multiplex all the data stream over a single connection, so you can exchange data between uh, both connections. So if, if you experience a, a loss with the upload stream, the download stream can be aware of that and it can switch uh, quicker. Uh, and the second thing is that if uh, quick is at applicative level, you can do more complicated scheduling like applicative uh, deadline and so on, uh, which is not possible with uh, MPCCP, which is in a kernel. And also, yeah, here it uh, points uh, comparing a test between MPCCP and MPQuick in the download case. 
we observe that we have, for a single case, we can have uh, an or an one or two order of magnitude of recurrence. Uh, it says that you can have tens of seconds of uh, latency with uh, multipacity, like while you can have like uh, one second with uh, multipacity. So to conclude, uh, multipacity uh, is a uh, seamless handover at transport layer in the sense that uh, you, the application will not notice anything. So, uh, but, and you, but while still trying to send on the Wi-Fi because cellular is expensive and so on. But uh, yeah, the issue is that with uh, interactive application, today multipacity, the way it's implemented, the way the scheduling is done, it's maybe not the best for this kind of application. And so we, we are going to study more with uh, multipass week, especially because uh, it, it's more flexible and uh, maybe we can find a, a better trade-off between the cellular usage and uh, the, the, the latency that we experience at the application. Thank you. If you have any question, please. Yeah, so uh, it is the multipass CCP in the iOS kernel. So uh, this is not the, the Linux one, which is the most studied. So actually iOS uh, in uh, MTPCP is not, I, I don't think there is any study uh, about uh, iOS and MTPCP because it's quite new. Uh, and because uh, Apple did never uh, made any publication about that. And multipass uh, quick, uh, it's an implementation uh, that we presented at Connext. And it's a uh, quick go, so a, a G quick, where we uh, added an extension so that you can use multiple paths. Uh, for you. Uh, actually, yes, because the, the, the multipath CCP is in the kernel, and the kernel is open source. Yeah, but you have to, to dig in. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's completely separated, and actually it was, uh, it's not the same implementation, and it does, and unlike the Linux implementation, it does not uh, implement fully multipath CP. Like uh, it missed the add address uh, feature, and this caused the issue that uh, I just mentioned with the IP multi connectivity. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the handover and the aggregate. So uh, the handover, the difference is that uh, it's, I think it's even more conservative in the sense that it will wait that Wi-Fi is completely lost. While here, uh, the main use case of the interactive is, uh, is uh, to have um, low latency, so, you, so it uses the cellular a little more aggressively. But uh, it still keeps the, per the user preference of Wi-Fi over cellular. While aggregates, uh, it's just a bandwidth aggregation. And, but we cannot uh, experience at large scale the aggregate mode because it's only for uh, phones that have uh, iOS beta. And so if you want to have uh, a application, we tried, and actually it crashed uh, the, the phone uh, on with uh, a production phone. So we, we stopped uh, using the aggregate mode. So what's your biggest takeaway with regards to the design of multipass? Uh, sorry? What's your biggest takeaway with regards to what we need to change on multipass TCP? Uh, I think there is something to change in the, the, the scheduling. Uh, typically the scheduling uh, has to, to, to be improved, has to, to be more clever. The issue with multipass TCP is that the scheduling is only the kernel, and the kernel has to be, remain simple. You cannot uh, keep a lot of memory and a lot of uh, uh, complicated heuristics inside the kernel. So one possible way to improve multipath CCP, at least for the, for the iOS case, is to uh, offer a way to define the scheduling at user space. It's in some, in some place like with using a function, or I don't know. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Pedro Marcos.
So good morning, everyone, and thank you, Marco, for the introduction. I would like to start my presentation with a little bit of context about what is happening on the internet today. So what we have seen in the last year is that network operators are relying even more on IXPs to improve what they are a traffic delivery performance on the internet. And the main reason for that is because IXPs are offering a rich path diverse. They are interconnecting hundred, hundreds of ASs and offering reachability to thousands of prefixes. But to benefit from this rich connectivity of IXPs, there is a problem that is before exchanging traffic, the operators need first to agree to start exchanging traffic. And the process of interconnecting as of, or as of today is mostly manual and length and driven by personal relationships and brand image. So just to illustrate, the process starts with finding a potential peering partner. This can be done by uh, checking your personal contacts or going to an Euro IX meeting. Then you find a peering partner, you go there and discuss the properties of the interconnection, you formalize the terms, and then finally you deploy the agreement. And this entire process, according to some operators that we have talked, it takes like a few days or a few weeks to be concluded. So there is a really limited responsiveness to the uh, internet traffic dynamics. So as a result of this process, operators miss interconnection opportunities. They have inefficient utilization of their peering ports. We can observe a lot of spare capacity at the IXP ports. And also the traffic deliver is not optimized. So here's an example. Let's focus on ASA. ASA is sending traffic towards ASC and D. And then a traffic search starts and it starts degrading the performance of the traffic, including the traffic, the traffic surge towards C, but it also degrades the traffic towards D because the path is the same, at least the first half of the path is the same. So, but if we know A could reach D towards the XP, but there is a problem here is that A does not have an interconnection agreement established with two or three and it takes time to establish this interconnection agreement so it cannot mitigate the impacts of the traffic search. So to unleash this unexplored potential that IXPs have to improve wide area traffic delivery performance, we have some requirements. The first one is to replace the manual process to something more structured. We also need to provide to network operators an expressive interface in which the operators can express what they are offering, what are their peering policies, to replace the personal relationships and brand image, we need a way to allow them to build trust instead of to automate also the process of building trust. And we need to do all this process in a privacy aware manner because operators are very co concerned about exposing information about their peering policies or the terms of their interconnection agreements. So we propose here Dynamics Dynamics is a framework that allows operators to improve wide area traffic delivery performance by quickly exploring the rich connectivity opportunities at the IXPs. Here is an overview of how Dynamics was designed. Dynamics is a demo that every AF that is connected to the IXP and wants to benefit from these features that we are offering needs to run. So it's a distributed uh, approach. We decided to do it in a distributed way to facilitate the process of achieving the privacy of the peering policies since the peering policies are locally stored at each AS, so it's not uh, available for anyone else except if the, the AS wants to make that information available for, for the others. And also to keep it the IXPs neutral in the process. We have spoken with some IXPs operators and they said they, they are not quite interested in interfering in the business relationships of their the ASs that are connected there because all of the ASs are their clients. So Dynamics has four components. The first component is a protocol that eases the process of finding other peering partners and establish the interconnection agreements. We also have an interconnection intent abstraction in which the operators express their peering policies, what are they offering and what they want. We have a distributed ledger where the, or the ASs can find information about the other ASs related to past previous agreements. So instead of only relying on personal relationships, I can 
check the past performance of the other AS based, based for example, on feedback of the other operators and take my decision. And we also have a component, we call it a legal framework that it intends to provide some guarantees about the properties of the agreements. So in case of there is a dispute, there is a template with the properties of the agreements stored there and then the ASs can handle the dispute. We already did a preliminary evaluation of our solution to evaluate dynamics. We have coded it in Python and we are using Hyperledger Fabric as the ledger to store the information about the previous interconnection agreements. We ran some experiments on AWS and our first question that we have tried to answer here was the benefit of our solution. So if it takes time to export the rich connectivity of XP with Dynamics, how long does it take to establish an interconnection agreement? Remember that today this time is between some days or weeks to be completed according to the network operators. So here is an example of the experiment that we did. Since there is no prior history about how the ASs will behave establishing the interconnection agreements, the idea was to do a scalability test. So from a, some number of ASs, or, or I mean all the ASs on the experiment are trying to establish an interconnection agreement with the same AS. It's a triple test, it's a stress test. So we measured two times the, the there are two different times that we have measured. In this plot the y-axis represents the average time of our experiment and the x-axis is the number of a ASs that we uh, run the experiment. So the blue line represents the time to find an interconnection offer in this uh, triple test. In the worst case, it's around 80 seconds. And the time to effectively establish the interconnection agreement with 200 ASs trying to do the same thing at the same time is around two minutes. And if we compare this with the current process that it takes some days or weeks to be completed, we are achieving our primary goal of enabling the use of the rich connectivity of the IXP. So if we transform that number in the number of agreements that an AS can establish per minute is around 80 agreements within a minute, we are aware that this is not practical on the internet, there is going to be a lot of route instability problems, but this is just to show the throughput that we can achieve. We are studying how to mitigate the potential impacts this of dynamics on the route instability. But just as a comment, in regular conditions where there is no stress test, two, a pair of ASs can establish an interconnection ag agreement in less than 10 seconds, which is quite good. So, in summary, we have presented a first, uh, an approach to unleash the potential of IXPs to improve wider traffic delivery performance. And more important than that, we are doing this preserving the privacy of their peering policies, which is a concern for the network operators. So with Dynamics, we are going to enhance the responsiveness of the internet traffic dynamics, be able to increase the peering policy periodization, and also create new economic opportunities for the AS. So since they are able to interconnect much more faster, maybe they are going to be able to establish new agreements they, that they wouldn't be able to establish in the current situation. Currently, we are evaluating the impacts of dynamics in terms of storage requirements since we have to store information about the other, uh, the previous interconnection agreements. So how does it will cost for the AS to have this information? And also the bandwidth requirements because Dynamics is designed to run over the IXP infrastructure, so we are not willing to interfere on the traffic that is running on the IXP. And finally, currently, we are partnering with a company that offers a global peering infrastructure to deploy Dynamics and offer it to their clients. So with that, I conclude my talk and I'm more than happy to take your questions. After speaking with network operators, the, their main concern is that they have their peering policy. For, for example, who I'm going to interconnect or what are the routes that I'm offering for the other ASs when I establish an interconnection agreement and also what are the properties of my interconnection agreements that I have established. So I, I believe that we are uh, 
achieving this by keeping all this information about the hearing policies locally stored on the autonomous systems. And the AS will only disclose that information if he's intended to establish an interconnection agreement with someone. So if someone tries to interconnect with, asks for an interconnection with that AS and he's not willing to interconnect, they can simply ignore the request and not disclose the, their hearing policy. Um, so what information are you planning to store in the ledger? Because that seems to be about reputation and past connectivity, which seems to contradict the privacy aspect. Yeah, that, that's a, a good question. We are, we are also working on this, this aspect. Uh, we, can, we, are, we didn't define yet the exact type of information that we are storing on the ledger. It can be more like a feedback by the operator saying, oh, this was a good AS to interconnect, so there is no private information here. But it can also be more re related to uh, adherence to SLAs or control plane information. But there is a problem here that I'm aware that we need to guarantee that no information that is related to the business policy would be available for the other ASs. Well, trust is, in, in our case, is just a way to complement the information that the ASs have to decide whether or not to interconnect with another network. So our idea is to provide a set of information. It can be like subjective information or control plane information or data plane information about the previous agreements and let the, 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 uh, the own AS decide how to use that information to decide whether or not they should trust out the other network. Arpit. Well, we have been observing on the internet some events like trap searches and net, uh, network outages, so we don't need to be in the order of seconds, but we definitely need to be better than we have today. For example, today we have some, uh, we have seen cases of outages that last for 12 hours a day, and maybe then the ISP is not able to deliver the traffic accordingly, but if there is something like Dynamics, he could reroute the traffic to the ISP and handle the situation. So that's our main motivation. And also, uh, we are in our ongoing work, we have some ISP trace data analysis where we show that there is a lot of spare capacity at the ISP port, so we, we also think that this capacity could be better utilized since they are paying for having this dead capacity. Um, so which additional steps are necessary besides signing the contract to actually have traffic flowing and what's the all time that it takes to do those? Well, the, the time to, uh, I'm assuming that you are mentioning the time to deploy the interconnection agreement after the, the established agreement. So the time to deploy this is currently not part of our design. And this is based on uh, information from the network operators that they told us that they already have scripts to automate this process. So it's more like just a engineering process and not a research challenge. So we can add this on Dynamics, but. It's not part of the research itself. Well, according to our IXP guy that works with us and has the experience, uh, it don't take that long, it's some minutes, I think. Okay. So thank you very much, Pedro. <laughs> I would like to invite on stage now Mohamed al -Azmar. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present Polyraptor, which is an efficient data transport protocol in data centers. So before starting talking about Polyraptor, I'm going to talk about the challenges that we are trying to tackle in this research. So we have four main challenges here. The first one, we are trying to have an efficient one-to-many data transport protocol in data centers where we need to create uh, replicating copies of our data to different servers. 
like in Google file systems. And the second challenge is we are trying to have a reliable many to one transmissions where a client can fetch data from different servers, like in distributed storage systems. And the third challenge that we are trying to tackle here is we are trying to eliminate NCAFs. NCAF happens when there are multiple concurrent senders sent to the same receiver. That's gonna create a bottleneck at the receiver's link, and that's gonna make throughput collapse to all senders. The fourth challenge here we are trying to uh, have better utilization of uh, data center by using per packet uh, transmissions instead of per flow ECMP. So we are proposing Polar Raptor, which supports one to many and many to one reliable transmissions, and it eliminates in cast and it supports multipath as we will see now. So I'm gonna start talking about the design of Polar Raptor. That is here, as you can see, we have one sender and one receiver. So Polyraptor is based on fountain calls, mainly Raptor Q calls. Just to give you an idea about the beauty of fountain calls in this scenario here, imagine you have a glass that you wanna fill that glass with water, and you have a fountain. You don't care what are the drops that you are gonna use to fill that glass. So as a, as a receiver, I don't care what are the symbols that I'm gonna receive from the senders. They all are equally useful for me. So that's the main feature of Raptor Q and fountain code, mainly fountain, fountain code and mainly Raptor Q. But that doesn't stand alone. So we have a receiver driven approach. So the receiver, which is me in that case, I'm gonna control that fountain and I'm gonna get as much as I want number of symbols based on that connection as we'll see here. So what we do here, so we have one sender and we have one receiver, so the sender, we divide then for each source block, we encode our source block into what we call encoding symbols. So each encoding symbol includes source symbols, which is the original source block, plus repair or redundant symbols. So the first feature is here is Raptor Q codes are systematic codes. That means we have in our encoding symbols the source data that we have here. What's the beauty of this feature? If there is no condition in the network and there are no losses, if we receive the whole source symbols, that means at the receiver side, we don't need to do decoding. So that's gonna make it better performance. So the other feature here, we don't care about ordering here. So what we do here, we just spray buckets. So that if there is a loss, that's absolutely fine. We don't need to have any kind of uh, acknowledgement or retransmissions, these kind of notions that we have with TCP. Because the receiver is gonna request another one, and uh, the, 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 the sender can provide us with limitless number of repair symbols. So this encoding block can create endless number of encoding symbols based on the requests from the receiver. So the receiver is gonna request another one, we will receive another one. Now the receiver has received eight symbols, which is K in our example here, that's just an example. And the receiver now can start decoding. So for the receiver to be able to start decoding, the receiver should receive minimum K number of source symbol, which makes sense. Otherwise, if you receive less than K, you can't decode the whole source block. So after receiving K, the receiver is gonna, uh, the receiver is gonna start decoding. And it doesn't matter what order we receive. And it doesn't matter if we receive a source or repair symbols. They all are useful for the receiver. So ordering is not important here. And there are uh, rateless codes. You can get ed endless number, uh, endless supply. No need for re retransmissions. The last feature here, here about decoding. Decoding, uh, Raptor Q has an excellent decoding performance. I'll give you numbers here. If you, if the overhead is two symbols, so for one source block, if you just receive K plus two, the probability of failure will be 10 to the power minus six. So this uh, implementation is based, based on the user's requirements. So if the user wants to start decoding immediately after receiving K number of symbols, the probability of failure will be 10 to the power minus five. If the, the receiver is gonna wait until, if the receiver is gonna request two more, K plus two, the probability of failure will be 10 to the power minus six. If you will get more, the probability will go low. So again, in found encoding, if any subset of encoding symbols are useful, it doesn't matter what is received or lost, 
the only thing that matters here is to receive, receive enough number of symbols. So it's a receiver-driven approach. The receiver is, is the one who's going to control that fountain, which is the sender. So by using Rapture Q, we can target all of our challenges, as we will see now. So in the first challenge, in many-to-one scenarios, we have here two senders and one receiver. So the sender, uh, both senders, we have two, uh, the same data at each sender, and the client, which is the receiver, is going to fetch data from these replicas here. So we, we need to make sure that each sender is going to create a unique source encoding symbols. Because if each sender is going to send the same thing, that doesn't make sense because we are going to create replicas in the network without any usage. So we, we use different seeds for each encoding block at each sender. So each sender is going to uh, create unique encoding symbols. Then after uh, we, we are employing NDP switch, so we have two uh, queues at each switch, data queue and header queues. So after receiving a data from one sender, we add a pull request at the pull queue at the receiver. So at the receiver side, upon receiving data packet, the receiver is going to add a pull request for that sender. So we receive one data packet from sender one, we add pull request for sender one, we receive another one from sender two, we add pull request for sender two. Now the, the receiver is going to start passing requests to each sender, and the receiver knows it, the capability of its length, because in data centers we know the bandwidth of our lengths. So the receiver is going to pass based on the link speed to make sure that it's not going to cre create congestion at the receiver side. That's why we eliminate in cast by this way, because if you use TCP and TCP, if the packet is going to be dropped, you have to wait for time out. The receiver won't know about what's happening in that switch. But in that way, we have a fast, so for example, I'll show you this example now. So if that shallow buffer queue, the data queue is full, if an incoming packet to that uh, switch, we don't drop that packet, we trim it, and we take the header to the header queue, which is a priority queue, so that's kind of fast notification to the receiver about what's happening there. So upon receiving either header or data queue, the receiver is going to add a pull request for that sender. The other feature here, if one of the senders can't contribute to this transmission as the other one, that's absolutely fine. So if sender one, if the link of sender one is congested, that's fine. We keep requesting from sender two, and at the end, as you can see here, we have received four the blue the blue symbols four from sender. Uh, Four, for, four from sender two and just the three from sender one. That's absolutely fine because they all are useful for us. So this is many to one. Sorry, I need to skip that slide. I should have removed it. That's mainly the NDP paper, which was the best paper in SUPOM last year. Which, okay, so in our simulation for many to one, we use 250 servers and we simulate 10,000 uh, uh, sessions. Each session has a four, uh, size of four, four megabytes and we run background traffic of 2,000 uh, sessions and we uh, simulate traffic uh, matrix permutation and random and we have two scenarios of one and three replicas. So for the results of many to one, here we have what we call session. So the, the, the session here it means we have three senders and one receiver, that's one session. TCP doesn't support many to, ma to one communication. That's why we use like multi-unicasting TCP connection, as you can see here. So in our results here, the black line, as the, the black dashed line, as you can see, is just for one sender based on polyraptor. And the red dashed line is with the three senders based on polyraptor. The, the x-axis represents the rank of all the sessions that we run and the y-axis represents a good cost for each session. So we run 10,000 sessions. Each session has a group of three senders and one receiver. We do the same thing for one to many. So in one to, in one to many, we have one sender and two receivers here, as you can see. So we have full queue at each receiver to request packets. So the sender is gonna send one packet. The we don't create replicate replicas at the sender side we make the switches to create replicas because we don't want to create congestion in the network. So after receiving replica from each, uh, from the switch, the receiver is going to add pull request. 
then add pull request, then it's gonna start pressing the request. After receiving another re uh, request, it's gonna send another data packet to the receiver. And the results of one to many, again, we have here uh, one sender and three receiver, uh, kind of multicasting group here. We have 10,000 again. And the uh, result here, the y-axis represents the, uh, the good calls. And you as you can see, Polyraptor achieves better performance than TCP. Finally, these, uh, this is, these are the results of NCAS scenario. We are running 70 parallel server to, who are communicating to the same receiver. And as you can see, there is a throughput collapse when we run TCP and we achieve better throughput with Polyraptor. So to conclude, by using Poly, Polyraptor, which is based on fountain encoding, along with NDB switch, along with receiver-driven approach, we are able to achieve all of our goals by having a reliable many-to-one, one-to-many, and eliminating in cast and using multipath by spraying the packet instead of using per flow ETMB. Thank you. That's the probability of uh, failure in decoding. Yeah. You fail to decode. Yes. Yeah. If you receive more, that's gonna be low. It is a graph, I don't have it here to be honest, but uh, as far as I remember the number, it's, it's gonna be either four or five. Yeah, I have a graph that shows all these characteristics. Yeah. I, th I can't hear you, sorry. Yeah. So as I, as I understand, you are saying, why do I compare my polyraptor protocol with TCP? Ah, okay, I guess. I think the main contribution here is employing fountain codes because fountain codes has a lot of features that we can benefit of from them. And but fountain code, as I said, it does, can't stand alone. So you need another mechanisms for congestion control and flow control mechanisms. So I think the answer is there is nothing can stand alone. We need all these features to come together to get all the goals that we are trying to achieve in this research. Yeah, okay, so the current work, I, I'm not gonna call it disadvantage, but the current work that we're trying to work on now, we are trying to implement this in, in real life systems and to see what, uh, what are the latency, what are the complexity that we are trying to have here. Fountain, uh, Raptor Q codes, they, they are linear. The complexity of them, it's, it's linear, which means the complexity uh, equal, uh, big O of one. So it doesn't matter what size of encoding symbols you will have. So the K, the K value doesn't matter what K, what K value you have here. Yeah, as I said, it's because, because it's like linear, the complexity is linear here. So we are, we have like a feeling that's a promising thing from the current results that we have here. They are promising and So in simulations, we didn't see any problem in the delay that we have here. 
the, the next step, which is the current work that we will be working on, implementing this protocol on a real systems. So if, if, if you have small packets that you want to send here, that means, so the, the, the math behind the encoding block there, it's just simply multiplications of matrices at the sender side. At the receiver side, it's just a Gaussian elimination process. So if you have a, a small packet, you can just have a small matrix, and the time there, the, no, there, there will, won't be any delay there, because the matrix is going to be small. That means you can, that's going to be fast, and that's going to work fine. Sorry, I, I, I think I'll have to cut it here because we are going out of time, but uh, Mohammed also has a poster downstairs, so you can continue also offline. Right, <coughs> oh, thank, thank you very thank much, you. Mohammed. <laughs> so our, our next speaker is Patrick Kalmbach. Uh, so please come on stage. Hello there, everyone. My name is Patrick Kahnbach and I'm from TU Munich. Um, so I started my PhD last year and what I'm presenting here today is more like still work in progress. So it's more like a final project and we're still working on it. And shout out to my bio. So um, I did my master in, in computer science with um, background more in artificial intelligence. And what I did there was looking a lot into um, how you can make sense of data. And when I came to networking, I saw that we have here a lot of graphs, so graphical representation of data. We have, for example, root-level graphs, we have S-level graphs. We can represent the World Wide Web as a graph. We can represent IP to IP communication as a graph. And those graphs are not really easy to understand, and they will grow even more complex if you think about uh, the IoT. This will add a large number of additional nodes, for example, to our IP communication. And we still somehow have to manage um, this massive, those massive networks. We have to make somehow sense out of it. And if you, for example, get a graph like this, um, well, if you have a smart layout program, like uh, the program with which I generated uh, this visualization, and you have a certain hypothesis about your graph, you might already see, for example, well, okay, here I have, for example, my stars. This is what, what I expect. I might want to uh, expect, expect a certain structure in the fork, for example, um, but yeah. So how to really see those patterns and how to expect ex ex patterns that you have not thought about beforehand. So patterns that might be new, patterns you simply don't have in mind. And if you have then a representation like this, um, you immediately see, for example, hey, okay, cool. Um, I have functional groups here. I can directly put um, usages to those groups and I, and, and I can understand what's going on in that graph. And those graphs are really the same. And if you have something like this, if you have something like this for your communication, you might use this, for example, to generate access control lists or identify abnormal behavior that does not um, comply to this uh, pattern that you um, that you see here. Uh, you can actually understand and see what's going on. So you can really project those thousands of nodes down to maybe only uh, a couple of tens that you can then really look at and understand what's going on. And you might then use this also for traffic engineering or resource allocation. The question that I'm starting to look at and then was, okay, how can I go from, from this hairball graph, from, from this unstructured data to a more structured visualization and representation? And what we looked at a lot during uh, my study uh, was probabilistic generative models, which um, are really a great tool to infer a model from data. And in this setting, you represent your data as a probability distribution. In this case, I use a probability distribution over graphs, which is parametric, and those parameters then encode the structure of your graph. So they encode what's going on. And the nice thing about it is now that you can give, um, give this process, you can give, take, the, take the data that you have, infer those parameters, and then you can also um, generate synthetic data back. So this you can, for example, then easily use for simulation purposes. Um, 
And one model that, uh, that we learned about, for example, was the stochastic blob model, which was uh, designed in the, um, back in the, in, the, in the 80s. And this model has two assumptions. The first one is that your graph consists of k groups that interact with each other. And edges form only based on the group membership of incident nodes. So basically, given the group membership of two nodes, I can tell you whether it's an edge or not. Um, what can you do with such a model? So you can really represent, it's very flexible, you can represent a large amount of different communication patterns. For example, you can uh, represent assortative mixing with this, which you can see in peer-to-peer -peer networks. You can uh, represent distortative mixing patterns, or you can uh, represent ordered mixing patterns, and you can also represent combinations of those patterns and, and even more ones. And that's what you can represent, uh, what you can also then infer back from your data to, um, to make those visualizations. And why would you want to use such a graphical model? So um, the first thing is it has integratable parameters. Um, so you can actually make sense out of it. You can interpret them, you can look at them, which is for example different if you just take a neural network or just take a clustering algorithm with, uh, with which outputs something, but it's not really clear how, how this um, interrelates. Uh, you can com easily compare different hypotheses by looking at, for example, likelihood or other information um, as measures. Uh, you can easily generate synthetic data for simulation for, um, or for validation. You can estimate missing or future structures, or you can identify structures that shouldn't be there. And it's scalable, so uh, to, to create a model, you don't necessarily need to look at all nodes, uh, representative stuff that might be enough. Um, and what we now did a little bit was on the one hand look into security. So we used um, this model to infer uh, basically the structure of IP to IP communication in a university network. And, and then we found, for example, nodes that do stuff like this. And um, it turned out that those were bots and we were able to uh, find those bots um, very reliably. What we also started to look at is unrolling this model over time. So and here you, for example, can identify also structural anomalies. So in, in this case, there was something happening in that uh, red circle time step. We don't know yet what exactly it was, um, but yeah, something strange was going on there. So what happened there? Um, another thing that we looked at is the synthetic data generation. And here you can, for example, also include a categorical distribution over your group groups. And this allows you to also very uh, scale the graphs, the number of nodes in the graph. What you do then is simply draw the groups um, for the node, and then draw edges according to those group labels. And this gives you then a synthetic graph which has the same large scale organizational structure as the original graph, but the connections might be different, and you might look at different, okay, what happens if my hosts communicate in a slightly different way, or communicate to different servers, you can maybe also then uh, analyze that a bit. And what we presented here in, in a poster session was then the inclusion of a weight of edge rates, and this would then also allow you to not only create a large-scale communication, com communication structure, but also, for example, at uh, the size of flows that are running between those nodes, uh, which you might then use, for example, to, for validation, or maybe also for other machine learning purposes if you're lacking the traces or the data to actually um, uh, do this well. So in summary, what, um, what we did so far, oh, geez, what we did so far is extract this logical structure of communication networks. We mostly did like really looked into it and reflect that the structure, does it make sense? Does it comply with, um, with intuitions we have about this network? Um, and we did some proof of concept work, for example, uh, regenerating a traffic using this weighted stochastic blob model and checking if this actually matches or Im improves what we can obtain with this alternative model. And we also looked a little bit into how we can do anomaly detection with this. And for the future work, well, what we want to tackle next is basically incorporate node metadata that you can, for example, have uh, better groups that align better with metadata and, and improve uh, your intuition about what's actually going on and also to obtain a good prior distribution for unseen nodes. So basically, given the node metadata, you can uh, then derive um, a probability distribution over the groups. So basically, um, at the moment, you, if you don't know the group membership, you're a bit, little bit lost. So in this, this metadata, you can then uh, uh, fit, fit those nodes to respective groups. And then we also want really to, to investigate how we can use this for network management, for example, and use this to predict the sizes of flows and then use this to make routing decisions 
um, use it for structural anomaly detection, so change point detection, or use it for um, behavioral anomaly detection, basically detecting more there. So that's it from my side. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, this is basically at a probability of um, edges between those points. So this is a little bit a, a chicken egg problem. So uh, you you can derive you can derive the model from your data. But now assume you have one new node, which you don't know the group membership of. So which group does it belong to? You have not observed, for example, edges yet. It's a new node that comes to your network. Uh, you don't know edges yet, so you can't really fit it into that. Um, and, and at the moment, it's, you can't say which group this, this host might belong to. You can use the categorical distribution and say, OK, um, I have here very large groups, so it's most likely one of those. But if you have additional node metadata and incorporate it into your model, you can condition this uh, on, on a uh, this, yeah, this, this you, this you can do. Yes, this you can do. Yeah. So this, uh, the stochastic block model actually originates in, in the social sciences. Um, it is heavily, was heavily developed now in the last 10 years in, in a, a statistical physics community, complex system theory. And um, you have, I don't know what you are referring to, so are you referring to modularity? No, this is this is basically the methodology from uh, from that domain. Okay. Well, let's thank you again, Patrick. <laughs> uh, so this is our last uh, presentation for today. So uh, Suraj Jog. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Suraj Jog, and today I'll present my work on enabling dense spatial reuse for millimeter wave networks. So currently, the Wi-Fi bands that we operate on have very limited bandwidth, and these cannot enable throughput intensive applications like wireless VR or wireless 4K video streaming. So to alleviate this problem to some extent, the FCC recently released up to 14 gigahertz of unlicensed spectrum in the millimeter wave band. So with such huge amounts of spectrum available, you can now have wireless links that give you data rates of something like four GBPS. And this can enable exciting new applications. However, these millimeter wave radios are actually quite different from the traditional radios we have today because they use very directional narrow beams for, to communicate with each other. And this means that now we have an opportunity to enable extreme spatial reuse because we can add multiple APs side by side and they can all communicate simultaneously without interfering or having to timeshare the channel. 
Now, this is something we don't traditionally see in uh, wireless networks today because the antennas are omnidirectional. You place multiple antennas side by side, they still interfere and they time share the channel. Of course, there are many advanced techniques like uh, distributed MIMO and so on, but these typically work only on the downlink and the associated complexity in the system is higher. So given this opportunity for spatial reuse and the fact that now you have multi GBPS wireless link, millimeter wave is now a very good candidate for exciting new applications like wireless VR for education or wireless VR for professional training where you might have military personnel who are training for combat situations. And over here, you require dedicated high bandwidth links to each user in the network. Another very exciting application this enables is robotic factory automation, where multiple robots have to stream high quality video back to control servers to help them take decisions and collaborate and accomplish tasks. Now one thing to notice here is that we're talking about networks with multiple users. If we had just one student or one soldier, it's not that hard a task because we know millimeter wave, millimeter wave can give you the required data rate. But what if you had five students, 10 students, 20 students? Can you still enable that each of them can get the data rate they require to enable such an application? So our objective in this work is, can we design a real time and a practical protocol that can achieve this vision of spatial reuse and enable multiple links to communicate at such high data rates. In order to achieve this vision, we need to uh, address two key challenges. One, how do you align the beams of the radios in 3D space? And two, how do you accommodate for client mobility and the dynamic nature of the environment? So let us look at the first challenge. As we said, millimeter wave is directional communication. And before you can start transmitting packets, the beams need to align towards each other. Now in a network with a single link, this is pretty straightforward, right? You align along the line of sight path. In fact, even in a network with one AP and multiple clients, you want the AP to align along the line of sight for each of the clients. But what about a network with multiple APs and multiple clients? Is line of sight alignment still the smartest thing to do? That is what this, that's the question we need to ask. So consider a situation like this, and from here, it should be evident that no, line of sight alignment for everyone is not the best thing always. Because over here, the two links involved interfere, and now they have to time share the channel, which cuts your throughput in half. Unfortunately, this is what the 802.11 AD standard does today. It aligns all the links along the line of sight path, and if they interfere, tough luck, you need to share the channel. But what if, we could find alternate propagation paths. So for instance, over here, perhaps there might have been a metal cabinet along the wall and you could reflect or you could bounce the signal off this metal cabinet and sustain communication for link two while reducing interference at link one. So by enabling something like this, you can have more and more links communicate simultaneously and something like this would perform better than what the naive thing that the standard does. And this is the core idea upon which we build our system Millinet. It starts off by finding all the propagation paths between the links in the network. It identifies what set of links, what set of paths could coexist. And then it aligns the beams of the links either along the direct path or along some reflected path. So for instance, in this situation that we had here, Millinet would do something like this, where it would have, it would compute a set of beam alignments where link one would get to communicate on the direct path for some amount of time, and link two would get to uh, communicate on the direct path on some other amount of time. This is done to maintain some notion of fairness because every link wants to transmit on its highest data rate path for some amount of time. What is happening on top of that is additional links are kind of squeezing in themselves within the time slots by choosing some alternate propagation paths to fit themselves in into the time slots. The next challenge that we need to address is, you know, fine, you have this idea that you can use propagation paths alternate, you can squeeze in as many as you can, but you're dealing with a dynamic environment. How do you accommodate for client mobility and the fact that things are always changing? So over here we have these clients, if the clients are constantly moving around, then the propagation paths are changing, the interference patterns are changing. If you had to remeasure all of this again and again to compute the optimal alignment, 
that would require order n square such measurements for a network with n links. This is a overhead that simply does not scale. So instead, what we design is, we design an algorithm which does not require any explicit packet measurements to identify this multipath or the interference. Our key idea is, hey, why don't we reuse measurements that were taken during the beam alignment phase? So to step back a bit, as we mentioned, communication is directional, so the AP and the client have to align the beams together. The way this happens is, the client is in the omnidirectional mode, and the AP sends packets in each direction one by one. After this, the AP asks the client, hey, what direction did you hear me best on? Instead, what we are proposing, the AP should ask, tell me all the directions you heard me from. So what's happening now is the standard is collecting all these measurements and throwing away most of them and choosing only the high SNR path. We are saying, don't do that. These packet measurements have very useful information and by running computations on them, you can identify all the propagation paths between every AP and every client in the network. And moreover, by accounting for beam pattern uh, imperfections, you can also identify the amount of interference between any two links communicating along any propagation path. So in this way, without adding any additional packet measurement overhead, our system can continuously maintain an up-to-date view of the network and can constantly self-configure and readapt itself to uh, give you the best performance. And the beam alignment happens once every 100 milliseconds. So it's constantly getting updated information about what's happening in the environment. So building upon these two key ideas, we implement our system in an experimental test bed. Here are the 60 gigahertz radios that we use, and this is the room layout where we set up our experiments. The blue squares represent the AP positions, and the green locations are where the clients are distributed. As preliminary results, we wanted to understand how the total network data rate changes with the number of clients. We run two kinds of experiments where, in one case, the antennas are equipped with three degree wide beams, and the other with 12 degree wide beams. Now, as you can notice here, Millinet scales the total network data rate with the number of clients. This means every additional AP that you add, you get proportional gain in the uh, network data rate, which is not true for the standard. As you can see, the network data rate saturates very fast. And there are two reasons why we have such gains over the standard. One, the standard only uses fixed line of sight paths, and it has no expressibility in squeezing in more links in between time slots, which is something that Millinet can do. And two, Millinet has a very efficient way of measuring all the interference in the network. In fact, it can do it within one, within one beam alignment phase. What the standard does today is actually very naive. It schedules explicit packet transmission slots where it exchanges packets and measures the interference. And it does this in a pairwise manner. So with order with n number of links, you have to have order n square such packet transmissions. And that's a huge amount of time to collect the interference information. And as a result, it also, it also takes way longer to converge to the optimal beam alignment. In fact, over here, we can see that Millinet can deliver data rates of more than 38 Gbps for 10 clients, which is almost six times higher than what the standard could achieve. And this is about 3.8 Gbps for each client. So this really gives us some hope that our system is along the right direction to achieve this goal of spatial reuse and give each user the amount of data rate required for high bandwidth applications. So something like 3.8 Gbps is actually sufficient to enable wireless VR for the applications we mentioned in the beginning. Uh, there is some body of related work. Um, some of them is for wireless data centers. In fact, in SICOM 2010 and SICOM 2009, there were similar ideas of bouncing signals off the, off the ceiling. But those are more for static topologies and the interference patterns are not really changing. Our, our problem is a little more challenging because we need to deal with mobile environments. There's been some millimeter wave work too, but it's either for static links or for instance, in some cases, they uh, augment the environment with various sensors to help with the alignment and so on. Um, yes. Uh, thank you. Yes. Yes, please. Yes. 
so um, one thing is we assume the orientation is fixed. So given a so given a fixed orientation, you just need to scan all your possible directions. So so. Oh, I, I see, I see. Um, oh, well, it is linear in uh, the number of directions. So you're right, you're right, you're right. But we are not taking that into account because that does not uh, change with the number of links. We are mainly looking at the dependence of the measurements on the number of links in the network. And given the f question about number of APs and number of clients, for now, we've always assumed that the number of clients and number of APs are the same. If there's a mismatch though, we have mechanisms to deal with that too. Yes, please. So uh, it's not as many as well because, so I, I could see that you were talking about maybe multiple reflections. The signal energy actually attenuates quite a lot after one single reflection. So second order reflections are still observable, but third order reflections are not as much. In fact, millimeter wave is also known for having sort of sparse reflections. So on average, we see about three to four paths. And the way we identify those paths is during the beam alignment, the client captures all the packets of the AP it heard. So if it heard four packets, it knows there were four directions. And the AP marks each of these packets so that the client has some perspective that from the AP side, what the uh, orientation was. I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes. So, uh, so with multicast, uh, the beams are actually quite narrow. You, you would have to have something wider. And so another uh, approach is, uh, you know, why don't you have like multi-pronged beams, right? You, you have like two beams and you direct them towards two clients. That's a little harder because if you were to do that, you need explicit control on each of your antenna elements. That requires multiple digital chains and it is not as easy. Yeah, so uh, it requires more hardware sophistication, which is not envisioned to come into the current uh, customer level uh, hardware. Thank you. Okay. So if there are no more questions, then uh, <coughs> I will give a uh, round of applause for Suraja. <laughs> and I would give also another round of applause for all the candidates. So we, uh, <laughs> so they knew only yesterday evening that they had to present this morning at 7 a.m. So you can imagine the stress and the amount of work that they put. The presentations were really great, so thanks again. And uh, especially thanks to all the jurors also for coming here in a massive number at 7 a.m. This was very, very nice and appreciated. Thanks a lot. Um, so just one information. So we will uh, announce the winners at the closing uh, uh, session today. So thanks a lot.